Welcome everybody and thank you very much for joining our webinar, Archiving Social Media Data Challenges and Proposed Solutions. In this webinar, we bring together experts with experience in working with social media data to discuss practical, ethical and legal challenges in archiving these data and in addressing those challenges. My colleague Johannes Breuer and I, Karen Boschewski, both from GESIS, are the organizers and we will guide you through this webinar. We would first like to share, share some practical information about this webinar with you. By default, the microphones of all persons who are not presenting are muted. You have the possibility to post questions to the presenters using the question chat box at any time. All questions will be collected for the discussion during the round table. It will make things easier if you could post your questions as soon as they occur and not wait until the presentations are over. Also, if your, present, if your question concerns a certain presentation or presenter, please let us know which or who this refers to. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and the recording as well as the slides will be published. So this is our agenda for today. We will start with the introduction of the speakers. Following, the panelists will give their presentations. We will finish this webinar with a roundtable discussion. Now I would like to quickly introduce the organizers. Johannes Breuer is a senior researcher at GESES Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences in Cologne. His work focuses on the topics of digital trace data and data linking. Johannes is the coordinator of the SESTA work plan New Data Types project for 2020. His other research interests include the use and effects of digital media, computational methods, data management, and open science. And this is me. I'm Karen Moschewski. I'm also working at GESIS. And currently, I'm one of the two project leaders of the SESTA Metadata Office. I also work in the SESTA New Data Types project. I have a master's degree in empirical, political and social research and do research and migration studies. Now I would like to introduce the panelists. Libby Hemphill is the director of the Resource Center for Minority Data at the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, ICPSR where she leads ICPSR's efforts to ensure conclusive representation in their data collections. She also leads ICPSR's efforts to archive social media data and to understand the impacts of curation on data reuse. Janusz Stebe is the head of Slovenian Social Science Data Archive, ADP, and leads the National Research Data Alliance Node. He is active in international networks and associations of research data integration, in particular SESTA. Recently, he collaborated in one of the tasks of the European Research Infrastructure Project, CERIS, about legal, ethical and quality challenges of social media data sharing. Sarah Day Thompson is the newly appointed digital archivist at the University of Edinburgh where she looks after the curation and long-term preservation of university digital collections. She was previously research officer at the Digital Preservation Coalition, where she coordinated the Web Archiving and Preservation Working Group and authored the DPC Technology Watch Report, Preserving Social Media. Libby Bishop is the coordinator for international data infrastructures in the data archive at GESIS Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. She recently published an article, Ethical Issues in Data Sharing and Archiving, in our Epofen's Handbook of Research Ethics and Scientific Integrity. Sebastian Kacher is a research assistant professor at political science of political science at Syracuse University 
and the Associate Director of the Qualitative Data Repository QDR. He oversees data curation for QDR. Oliver Wattela is a senior researcher in the GESIS Department Data Archive for the Social Sciences. He is a research data management expert with a focus on legal issues, especially data protection. Oliver is in charge of data acquisition and, together with his colleague Anya Perry, he consults data depositors. And now we will start our first contribution by Libby Hemphill. Hello. Let's see if I turn my webcam back on too, but I think this will just be me and my presentation so I don't take up too much part, too many parts of your screen. Um, hi, so my name is Libby Hemphill. As she said, I'm at the uh, ICPSR in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and my primary responsibilities are for inclusive data in our collections. Uh, but I also am leading our efforts to archive or to develop policies around archiving social media data, uh, in part because I use a lot of social media data in my own research um, on political communication and inclusive conversations online. Um, and I am a machine applied machine learning researcher. So when I say social media data, I mean large scale data. I know Sebastian is going to talk about smaller scale data later, but that's um, where I'm coming from. So at ICPSR, um, we have been thinking about what makes social media data like other social science data. So what are we already doing with social science data that might apply to social media data as well? Uh, and we did a survey that you can read about in JSIS. I have a link at the end of the presentation um, of researchers who work with social media data to try to figure out um, how they think about it and their data management practices and how those might be different. But what we found is that even when working with social science data uh, or with social media data, researchers are worried about getting scooped, meaning that someone else will publish on their topic before they do. Um, that preparing data for someone else to reuse it, even if it comes from something like a Twitter API that's commonly used, takes a lot of effort and time. And third, that found data, which is one way that we talk about these sort of digital traces, uh, requires special manipulation and documentation. And what I mean here are things like, what does time mean in a Twitter stream or a Reddit month? Uh, whose time are we talking about? The server time, the user time, uh, and what does it mean to document a stream versus a periodic moment or something like a survey that we have more expertise in at ICPSR. And by manipulation, uh, I mean that sort of how data was collected needs to be documented. So for instance, was it through an API using particular search terms? Um, was it downloaded from PushShift or some other place that does some archiving? Uh, that these questions matter to researchers when they're trying to understand the provenance of data and its applicability to their questions. Uh, but what makes it special? So those are things that social media data has in common. And I started to talk about what is a little bit different about how it needs to be documented. I think about the differences between social media data and other types of social science data in three ways. First, properties of the data, specifically the scale, speed, and structure of social media data. Second, data practices, that what it means to find or curate or share or store is different. Uh, and then third, that we have different ethical considerations um, because many of these data have private owners, whether it's Reddit or Twitter or Facebook or MeWe. Um, and uh, sorry, I should have written out PIA. Uh, personally identifiable information um, also leads to different ethical considerations. So when we're thinking about how will we and whether really will we archive social media data at ICPSR, I'm thinking about its properties, practices, and ethics when we make those types of decisions. What I mean by scale, so ICPSR's existing archive, when it's compressed, is about eight to nine terabytes of data. We're one of the largest social science data archives in the world. So this is a, a pretty large estimate of size of the social science data. But what does eight to nine terabytes mean uh, for social media? So it's about two billion tweets, which is a couple of days. Uh, it's 1,400 months of gab posts. 
uh, or 15 months of Reddit comments. Um, and so that gives you some sense of just how different is the scale at which we're working, that it's talking about a little over a year of data from one place, a couple of weeks really of data from another place, uh, compared to surveys, which is sort of our bread and butter at ICPSR, we're talking about a completely different computational infrastructure to deal with this type of data. Uh, the structure, this is, I started to hint at metadata structures when I mentioned the provenance and documentation of the data, um, that our current metadata scheme that has questions like date and geography uh, are difficult to capture for social media data where some of that information is either unavailable or is open to interpretation. And so the way that we think about metadata needs to change. Um, and this question about how much should we invest in observation level indexing? So observation level indexing means that when you search our data archive, you would be able to receive a single social media post rather than a collection of social media posts that someone has deposited. And the computational infrastructure that's required for observation level indexing exceeds that that's required for indexing at the collection level. And so this is a sort of resource investment that how important is it to be able to return a single social media object rather than a collection of objects. Uh, and when I think about ethics, the first question that I wonder about is when or how we should consider user's intent when making collection development decisions. So here, when I think of users, I'm thinking of people who are using social media and whether or not they would consent to having their data included in a particular collection. And I ask this as a question because I think that the answer is neither, never, nor always. Uh, but there are moments where including a user's content, even if they wouldn't have wanted us to, is important for science and society and that we need to weigh those decisions. Uh, and that can be a little bit paralyzing to think of all of them at once. The second is, should SOMAR, which is the social media archive at ICPSR, be all restricted access? So we have um, processes for confidentiality protection in place at ICPSR that fall under our restricted access rules. And whether SOMAR, because it has so much potential to disclose information about individual users, might all fall under restricted access, even if the data is technically public by some definition before it comes to ICPSR. And that's related to how we decide who can see the data and what use terms um, would be allowed. And this schematic is a overview of the sort of the technical infrastructure that we are designing at ICPSR, where if you follow the purple arrows, um, we don't do anything to the data. We just take it in and hold it and send it back out in the same way that it comes to us. So this is sort of like documenting the now's set of tweet IDs, where you can deposit a set of tweet IDs and you can receive that same set. The blue circle, or I don't know, uh, I guess it's not a circle, but it's a, loop. Uh, the blue loop is one way that we try to accommodate platforms terms of service that prohibit sharing data by the person who did the collecting, uh, in which case we take in identifiers um, and then we rehydrate those identifiers depending on what platform they're from, whether from Twitter or Gab or Reddit, etc. Uh, and we hold that, so we do the collecting and the archiving at ICPSR and we return via the purple route only the lines or only the data that we're allowed to share under those terms. Um, one of the challenges here is that as soon as you have collected a data set, some amount of it will be deleted or removed for any number of reasons. And so all of our rehydration loops will always be incomplete uh, unless we do the original collection. Um, but we are an archive, not a data collector necessarily, so that is a little complicated for us and requires a different infrastructure as well. So in thinking about what we think are our main challenges that I would love to talk more about, um, and then I'm looking forward to hearing um, from other panelists about how they deal with metadata, terms of service, computational and technical resources, privacy, these trade-offs between costs and benefits. And you can read more about what we're up to and the research that we're doing around developing our archive at JSYST um, and a web archiving and digital libraries presentation from a couple of years ago. Thanks for your time. I look forward to our conversation.
Thank you very much, Libby. And our next pre presentation will be held by Janis Stebe. Hello, everyone. Now I'm sharing my screen. And uh, well, um, this is just, uh, the beginning of my uh, presentation. And um, I would like to talk uh, a little bit about um, first of the, about the FAIR data maturity model. And uh, this model was applied then to uh, some selected cases of social media archiving. Uh, the, the model itself, uh, I, I'm sure you, you most of all of you are familiar with, with the terms and the principles of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, but the, the data maturity model was developed uh, uh, at the working group of Research Data Alliance actually to, um, to uh, operationalize uh, uh, different aspects of the original definitions of fairness. And uh, it is based on the review of uh, many other uh, already developed models to actually to measure fairness and uh, so uh, I kind of assume that uh, this is uh, uh, a good model also to try to apply it to uh, social media data. And uh, well, fair principles as such uh, probably need to be uh, considered through all the data life cycle stages. And uh, we, we learned already that uh, it's already at the beginning of data collection that uh, there are certain decisions that may affect uh, uh, further possibilities of uh, archiving. So um, even in evaluating uh, the data object as such, which is uh, the, the, ma the main uh, aim of uh, fairness assessment, you should also consider certain characteristic of repositories and uh, for example um, uh, in, in some cases that uh, we, we encountered uh, of social media archiving they are uh, maybe at the repositories, the general repositories uh, that are kind of self-archiving uh, um, and uh, with little curation and some of them are in uh, collections or, or in, in um, some disciplinary repositories, uh, is ICPSR or many of says that data archives. Uh, so it was mentioned already that uh, ADP, Social Science Data Archives from Slovenia, we, we participated uh, in a series project uh, which actually uh, addressed uh, mainly ethical and legal issues of uh, new types of data. Uh, including social media data and there were a few reports uh, published and some guides and question and answers uh, um, um, and deliverables or, or, or documents uh, and there was there was also a small part of actually uh, identifying some already existing cases of social media archiving uh, which are there there are more and more of them and uh, so this was just uh, kind of uh, at the end of the project, we actually uh, uh, also tackled also these aspects. And uh, with this CESDA work plan task project, uh, in, in certain uh, respect, we want to continue just this part. Uh, so uh, actually to, 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 to uh, deal more with the data archiving as such and uh, so uh, the the goal the challenge of the uh, new gate, gate project that is led by Gezis and Johannes uh, was mentioned already at the introduction is uh, to one well, one one of the introduction goal is actually to assess the fairness or, or um, to 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 be informed informed by by the fairness principles about how to uh, develop the practice of uh, data archiving uh, for, for CESDA or existing data archives. This is a challenge how to actually uh, improve or, or adapt existing uh, infrastructure. Uh, so um, 
actually that the project um, is in in very very beginning phase and i will just show you um kind of a, a concept of uh, how how uh, we, we may uh, approach this uh, uh fairness uh, uh as as a guidance for 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 the data sharing and uh, so uh here i will present some preliminary preliminary work around uh, fair with with aim to apply this data maturity model and uh, try to demonstrate the usefulness of uh, actually uh, the model itself because this is very new and uh, the, the working group RDA working group is uh, uh, just at the end of producing uh, the model as such and uh, they are looking uh, um, for for different uh, um, tests. Or of application of the model itself but on the other hand uh, in applying this model to the social media data I think we can already um, find some potential uh, results uh, or uh, uh, some some new guidance uh, to, to, to decide which which aspects of the uh, data archiving of social media data to, to invest more so um i i i entered into this uh, testing uh, with with the uh, first selection of uh, some cases of social media data archiving some of the uh, from, from some previous reports and uh, um uh, some some uh, um the training uh, says that's a training package and some other um uh, portals they already uh, have uh, an overview of uh, examples of data archiving uh, and uh, also uh, I try to um, classify the categories of cases these are these are small number of cases and uh, I wanted to uh, uh, actually to, to, to show what is kind of typical or exceptional or problematic for certain cases and uh, uh, then also I, I tried to cover all the different like th three types of repositories like disciplinary general repositories and uh, thematic uh, social media sources so here is a list of uh, the cases but uh, uh, due to this early start of the project uh, I only test the approach for the four cases here uh, which are listed there and it's actually it's it's uh, it doesn't make sense to go into the details of the cases it's it's uh, themselves terrorist attacks uh, UK general elections uh, certain Twitter data and some other things news sharing uh, and in the mood um, there are uh, all, all of them are are related to certain articles also and uh, they they came from at least uh, two two uh, types of repositories and uh, so uh, I, I need to explain that uh, I, I actually I, I use the um, fairness uh, of data, data maturity model uh, as, as a simple tool there are uh, 41 criteria that you need to um, assess and uh, I, I actually uh, just um, try, tried to assess uh, the, the aspect there if, if a cert, certain um, feature is present or is not present so um, because uh, there, there are few suggestions how, to, how you can assess and I, I will talk about uh, some other approach uh, at the end and so here are as I said, some very preliminary results of the assessment of the four cases where uh, for each of the uh, letters uh, there are like 7, 12, 12 and 10 criteria you, you can assess and here is a percentage uh, of or, or uh, um, how, how many of them were fulfilled. Uh, I also need to, to um, uh, say that there is a reservation in assessment because you need to know many details about the repository about 
certain hidden feature of data when you are assessing this. So this is all um, th things that, that are also kind of a challenge of the approach itself. But uh, just maybe a comment of uh, these preliminary results, it can be that uh, we can see that uh, like uh, from the findable, uh, the, the aspect that was uh, missing uh, in a few cases was that the data itself, it didn't have uh, it, uh, its own identifier, persistent identifier, uh, because th this, this was also a discussion in the uh, RDA group, is there uh, a, um, an agreement about the approach, should it be there, you know, um, a separate identifier for data, and then the final decision um, conclusion was that this this might be useful, and then we can see there are differences, and also like for interoperable, which has the lowest score, which is not actually a surprise because this is a common finding also in other application of the fair assessment. Uh, there are also certain uh, aspects related to data itself because I mean the assessment here is like about metadata and data and uh, many of the criteria are like uh, they they, they uh, are addressing both simultaneously but then uh, the the model itself the, the assessment model the indicators separate uh, all, all those aspects for data and uh, metadata and here uh, we see that uh, data need to use like machine understandable knowledge representation and this is probably something that uh, Olivia already mentioned uh, about how to understand the dates or different uh, features in data uh, to be uh, then uh, um, more, more friendly for further use and uh, to, to be more informative. Uh, on the other hand we can also see that there, for, for, there is a, a bit of the difference of the uh, like repositories, uh, self archive repositories, and SESDA archives in the aspects of uh, um, reusability uh, as such. And this is actually a detail uh, that is uh, related to some understanding or, or usage of the standard licenses mainly here because uh, most of these self-archiving repositories are kind of more relaxed to use um, this standard uh, CC uh, licenses uh, compared to SESDA which uh, which are uh, probably which this follows also all, all the problem and issues of the legal uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, the terms of services uh, issues uh, that are then um, actually taken into the consideration and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, actually it's kind of ambivalence uh, they are involved about is, is this appropriate to use the licenses uh, like standard licenses but uh, this uh, I think it's, it's uh, an interesting result already uh, and uh, this is maybe a part of the discussion for the uh, of the further discussion, uh, how to kind of resolve this conflict between demands of the FAIR model and reality of social media as such. And uh, well, I just wanted to show an illustration but uh, 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 of uh, one other aspect here about uh, if the metadata is guaranteed to uh, remain available even after uh, the data is not longer available and there we, we can have from the literature uh, examples of uh, some uh, retract, re retracted data sets due to the ethical or other reasons but on the other hand we have a good practice from like NSD or UKDA which actually uh, in the policy already guarantees uh, the existence of media, uh, metadata and so, uh, well, I, I'm close to the uh, conclusions. Uh, I think there are some, there is some future future work uh, needed uh, to actually to, to maybe to, to refine the approach 
uh, one is uh, that maybe all the indicators are not uh, equally relevant for the social media data as such, but there is also a variety of this uh, social media data as such. Um, on the other hand, uh, there uh, we, we need probably to to work further on the approximation of uh, like different material levels for certain identical uh, indicators. Uh, in a sense that there, there is uh, like a suggestion from the model to actually to use scores from zero, not applicable to fully implemented. But then we need to find uh, examples or, or uh, categories that would apply to specific uh, social media types. And uh, this, I think this is something that we need to uh, kind of agree or try to find some further uh, definitions here um, and uh, just to conclude is I, I would again uh, want to uh, say that there is a reservation no no none of the examples uh, are uh, not are not shown as, as examples of bad practice uh, because the ultimate uh, aim of the fair uh, sharing framework is to actually to, to uh, motivate for improvement, and uh, I think that there is a, a, a place for uh, further discussion about how to improve there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, a lot Janice. Um, our next speaker is Sarah Day Thomas. Uh, sorry, Thompson. Um, Sarah, you have the floor. All right. Uh, so I'm assuming someone will tell me um, if they can't see my uh, slides. I will begin. So yes, I'm Sarah Day Thompson, uh, and I'm going to zoom out, I think, a little bit here with my uh, presentation. And I am not a social scientist. I don't work in the social sciences. Um, maybe do a little bit of dabbling. But I am, as of today, one month, the digital archivist at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, but the topic I'm talking about today, um, shared strategies, uh, for ethical collection building is largely based on my previous role as research officer at the Digital Preservation Coalition, where I ran a group called the Web Archiving and Preservation Working Group. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in a moment. So my presentation will do a little bit of background about this DPC Web Archiving and Preservation Group, um, talk about some of the different missions and mandates of the different organizations that participate in that group, um, how we went about trying to apply some ethical review in these very different contexts and found some shared strategies for ethical collection building. So the Digital Preservation Coalition, if you're not familiar with them, they are a membership organization uh, that are made up of over 100 different um, member institutions um, of all different shapes and sizes. And within that coalition, I ran this web archiving and Preservation Working Group, which was open to all DBC member organizations uh, and occasionally open more widely to the, to the whole community, archiving community. And this was a space for participants to share their experiences, their challenges, their progress, to establish some common goals where possible, to inform their own policy development and um, ways of learning from others. Uh, and perhaps especially to engage in a mutually supportive environment because the stuff is really hard uh, and it's difficult for everybody. So web archiving is complicated enough trying to look after, uh, curate and preserve social media is that much more complicated. Uh, so this is a quick visual representation of the different institutions that make up the DPC. So as you can see, it's all different types of sectors from universities to government archives to uh, banks to manufacturers. But there's also quite a range of size of organizations from huge national mammoth organizations to quite small little operations. Quite a lot of geographic diversity as well. So members uh, come from North America to Australia, um, although about 70 percent of members come from the UK and Ireland. Uh, but all of these organizations have demonstrated the critical importance of responsible stewardship of their digital resources, but also acknowledge the role of collaboration uh, and shared effort uh, to achieve good practice. And for those individuals at these organizations who have participated in the Web Archiving and Preservation Working Group, they have identified web and social media content as being one of those digital resources. 
So naturally, with that diversity um, of organization, you get quite a range of missions and mandates for archiving social media. Um, so I've organized these in um, not very scientific, social scientific method into general categories. We have your researcher generated data sets and that has very thoroughly covered by the other speakers. And um, so just move right along. You also have quite a lot of heritage institutions who collect social media based on collecting policies to support quite a broad range of research needs. And they tend to um, collect around major events or groups or themes. Uh, so for example, so many institutions at the moment proactively collecting um, their community, the community that they supports response uh, and experience of COVID-19 um, and the lockdown restrictions. We also have lots of organizations um, preserving social media for legal or regulatory compliance. So this is largely true for government or business archives who are interested in social media data uh, for its evidential value to demonstrate transparency and accountability uh, and potentially to do some um, consumer analytics or metrics. So back in January, um, which is ancient history now, the uh, Web Archiving and Preservation Working Group had an in-person, human-to-human uh, workshop, day-long event, specifically on uh, looking at preserving social media uh, and other more complex forms of, of web content. And part of that day was a workshop, um, a small group activity um, that was um, not exactly a debate, but kind of a debate. We uh, went with the term ethical deliberation uh, to archive Twitter or not to archive Twitter. Uh, and this discussion did focus on Twitter, but it did kind of venture into discussions of other uh, social media platforms uh, like Facebook. And if anyone is interested in what the exact uh, sort of arguments were uh, in, at that workshop, I'd be happy uh, to share that. Uh, but as um, coming out of that uh, workshop, um, there were a handful of some shared principles that emerged uh, and just to be clear, no one like signed a declaration or anything. These are just for observations uh, of uh, themes that arose from that workshop. And that is that social media data constitutes a valuable and critical asset and that platforms do not have a mandate or obligation to preserve these data, but collecting institutions do. That the requirement to archive social media supersedes the challenges of collecting it and that while ethical decisions are not one size fits all, a shared ethical framework will support more confident collecting. So a very common uh, trend throughout these uh, working group meetings over the years is that many organizations have identified um, the need to archive social media, but because they don't understand the full legal implications um, or the restrictions from the platforms um, or the ethical, fuller ethical implications, uh, they haven't actually started collecting the type of content that they have identified um, as being within their remit and of, of having a mandate to collect. So this discussion of an ethical review um, being contextual, that there's no one size fits all golden sort of answer, golden um, nugget that you can uh, just sort of pay for or embrace and, and you're off. It has to be based on a full review of all the different contextual sort of variables. Um, this type of review would consider variables like the purpose of collecting, why are you collecting this content, um, to what extent user awareness or consent is required, um, even evaluating the subjectivity or the conscious or unconscious bias of um, your collecting institution and how, how they collect, the legal and regulatory environment that might impact that particular uh, content or data set, the ethical mandate indeed that your organization has to collect that content, uh, the platform and functionality, I think we will discuss this, other speakers will touch on this, but the ethical implications uh, for Twitter, for instance, uh, might be very different from the ethical implications of archiving something from Facebook or from YouTube. Um, and also taking into consideration how to create meaningful access uh, for reuse um, of the particular um, content data in question and how that also has ethical implications. And so this is a personal observation um, from the experience of that workshop as well as previous experiences. So this is not to be attributed to the DPC's Web Archiving and Preservation Working Group. Um, but I have found in fact that it is unethical in some contexts not to archive social media data. So the discussion 
so far mainly is framed as is it ethical to archive social media data but i think it's important to be aware of situations where it's unethical not to archive social media data uh, because it is the responsibility of archives to support researchers and decision makers who can create meaningful positive change with the resources um, preserved and cared for by archives. So archives do indeed have a political responsibility to record and document to the best of their ability the full experience of the current historical moment. Uh, and those experiences are being played out on social media. And further to that, to the extent that social media platforms, uh, terms and conditions restrict or obstruct the mandate of an archive to collect relevant content, the archive should make this explicit and where possible to openly object. So in the interest of time, I, I won't go through all of these, um, but I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. So the Doc Finale project has already been mentioned a couple of times, uh, and they do have some really useful recommendations for thinking about ethical uh, collection building uh, in a white paper, ethical considerations for archiving social media content generated by contemporary uh, social movements, which was published in April of 2018. But I'm just going to... Um, pull out a couple of these because I think um, they're useful and I've not really touched on them already. Uh, but one is the role of archives uh, to educate social media users and researchers who might become depositors about terms of service, so taking on that proactive role of, of educating and training. Also, this new phenomenon of needing to directly engage and work with the relevant communities that are represented in the data that we're collecting. Um, and then lastly, not to forget to apply traditional archival practices such as appraisal and collection development and donor relations, even when these um, practices have to be pretty drastically adapted uh, to the format of social media. So in summary, um, no one size fits all, no one ring to bring them all together uh, and bind them. Um, but that good ethical practice is in the process. Uh, and that's me. Happy to pick up on uh, any of these themes in the roundtable. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your presentation. And next up is Libby Bishop. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think you might be able to see me and a screen by now. And I will get started. Well, you will see um, some very similar um, themes in my talk as in Sarah's. All right, let me do some repositioning here. So I also am going to continue on the theme of archiving social media as are we all ethical challenges. And again, a focus, but for me, a focus specifically on the data repositories themselves. So as Libby Hempel pointed out in the, the first talk, um, a lot of the focus on ethics that is done, done with social media often does concern, right, rightly so, things like the privacy and disclosure risk for individuals portrayed in social media in a tweet or something like that. And like like Sarah Day Thompson, I'm going to step back and look look at our roles as as repositories, as data archives, um, and start a bit with what we're actually doing. So what are we doing? Well, we, this has already been alluded to, but just to make it really clear, tweet, Twitter in particular is being archived. So these, this represents a couple of collections, one at UKDA, one at GESIS, and I think the important things to take away are, yes, it can be done, but the current uh, environment follows what I would call you know, safe solutions. So these um, comply with, with all legal interpretations, comply with, with Twitter's terms and services, which means uh, archiving tweets, tweet IDs only, and relying on a rehydration process like the one Libby Hempel talk, talked about to, um, to, to get back to, to full, um, full data. Now, there are additional options when your data are sensitive. And again, we've, we've covered these, these possibilities. So if data have disclosure risks, or even if there are concerns, it is possible for many, many archives have different levels of access controls that can be applied to the data. So here's a, a short case from a data set deposited at GESIS with geo, geotagged Twitter posts. 
Now this one is kind of interesting in the sense that, again, it's still following what I would say are the, the standard practice, if we have any such thing regarding social media yet at, at archives, archiving only tweet IDs to stay compliant with terms and, and conditions. However, the combination of no consent for archiving specifically and the fact that there was geodata collected simultaneously, which does increase a re-identification risk, caused the researchers to move this data into a higher um, risk category and therefore make it available only by request. Now within these constraints, these data I think uh, reach a, a level of fairness. That is, they are findable, they are pres preserved, and indeed they're even reproducible with the, the Python scripts. So they follow a, a, you know, the, an OEC guideline of open as possible but, but closed when, when necessary. But I would also, I think, um, push that it's not always totally satis satisfactory to feel like um, we, we're not archiving the full full set of data that we that we want to. So um, Sarah said she was stepping back. I'm stepping back yet yet further. Why archive at all? Um, why do we archive data? And I look at the kind of claims that archives, including the two that I have worked at and many others that I've worked with and, and, and know about, you know, we, we make pretty broad and grand claims, I would say, about our social responsibilities. We invoke preservation, historical value, holding data in perpetuity. We invoke reproducibility and, and replication. I won't go down that path now, but we can come back to it. Um, upholding the integrity of data and, and methodology. We certainly talk a great deal about data uh, openness, trying to open, open data, and as Giannis talked about, aspire to make that, that data fair. Um, and we claim, I would say, these lofty ideals, and we certainly do so in our mission statements and our funding applications. Um, I think I want to push a little bit on these goals and say, well, do we, are there your new responsibilities or do those responsibilities take on a different angle or a different dimension when dealing with social uh, social media? And you'll hear some, I will be echoing some things that, that Sarah said as, as well. So do archives have broader ethical responsibilities? Let me um, use a, a technique that I, I think works with some kinds of discussions a, a, around ethics. These are two mini scenarios, if you will. They are largely based on fact, as you'll see in a couple of, of the next slides, and you'll probably recognize them, them anyway. Um, they are not entirely factual, so they are constructed to raise ethical points. But a researcher wants to deposit data com com containing tweets from an account that was deleted by Twitter. She justifies the violation of the terms and conditions on grounds of historic significance and public interest. Should you accept the data as the, the archive? Okay, scenario one. Scenario two. A world famous researcher offers you gold star data. And for us, that's you know the great data, high quality, fantastic documentation, metadata, the whole, um, the whole shebang that underpins you know, even a widely read policy article. Well, again, this is the holy grail for us. We wanna hold data that's linked with key publications and, and so forth. So this is about the most tempting kind of stuff out there for us. However, most of the data can't actually be archived because of restrictions placed on the platform owner. So do you accept the data or do so with any other kinds of restrictions or conditions? So I think, you know, <clears throat> and you can see where I will be going with this, the, the nature of what social media data is doing and what it's documenting now, I think, has changed. I think, to be honest, I was skeptical of this probably even up until last year. I would say in the COVID era, there's no doubt that social media is becoming a fundamental part of an infrastructure about communication, organizing public opinion, a public square, and a means for public debate. So, of course, some of these examples um, you will, will probably recognize from my first scenario, there was, there has been um, a white nationalist group posing as, uh, as, a, as a, fr a front on Twitter. It created the impression that Antifa, the anti-fascist uh, anti -fascist organization was inciting violence at some of the protests around the George, um, George um, Floyd uh, alleged murder. Um, so 
it would no doubt be a violation of terms and conditions to archive this data. Twitter has removed the account and the tweets. And you will hear from Oliver later on the legal issues. And to be very clear, I am not immediately advocating uh, uh, breaking laws, but I am advocating rethinking uh, constraints that archives work under. So is there a competing duty to ask questions about things that might override um, other duties that ethical that archives might have um, to override complying with terms and, and conditions. So um, that is one of the examples. Then the second second scenario is one that I have to say is probably one of my personal little um, bugbears. Is again we talk a lot about um, making data fair but I'm a little bit more interested in which data it is we go after. So we tend to be, I won't say passive, but we work very hard about the data that, that comes to us, is offered to us. I'm really much more worried about the major data collections that are out there being used to make uh, policy claims in the world around things like inequality, political um, electoral debates, you know, you can um, racial uh, biases and, and so forth. And what is happening to that data and who is working to make some of that data fair? So Raj Chetty is probably one of the most famous economists in the world, professor, tenured professor at Harvard at, at 28 years of age. And indeed he is doing unbelievably good work as Robert Putnam says. But part of that, and this information is slightly dated, but I believe it is still valid, is because he has been able to get a hold, get access to data that nobody else was able to get access to. So these are the sweetheart deals that a high number of researchers, I would say particularly the ones I know about in the US at MIT and at Stanford and at Harvard, who have close relationships with Facebook and with Twitter doing this kind of research, but it is not then open for um, uh, uh, further for, um, further assessment, trans, uh, transparency, or any such thing. Um, there is, of course, the Social Science One initiative. We can come back to that in questions if people are, are interested. But what are the obligations of an, of an archive in these conditions? Do you refuse to publish data that's not shareable and lose this valuable resource? Do you strongly negotiate with a researcher trying to change their view? Do you even begin to fight with the platform and see if you can work something out? I would say we've sort of talked about these things, but we don't have we certainly don't have explicit strategies about these um, in many archives that I am aware of. So just to begin to, to wrap up, one point I do want to make is that um, the rules often have multiple interpretations. So Justin Littman is a, writes at um, George Washington, and while many archives have been narrowly interpreted interpreted this this Twitter terms and conditions about third party sharing, George Washington has actually used a fairly flexible definition um, allowing third party sharing to more or less anyone in their uh, entire university, including even collab uh, researcher collaborators. So I raise this just to point out one example where somebody has stretch the rules, I would say, and, and look toward a flexible interpretation rather than necessarily looking at the most conservative, most narrow interpretation of what of what is permitted. And this might be something for, for more of us to, to think about. So I'll just wrap up with, I think, I think times are changing. Um, we've heard that before. I think these debates are going to become much more intense because so much political um, research and work is happening using social media. And I do not think archives are going to escape addressing these questions, however uncomfortable they are. Uh, and as somebody who's worked in, in two for a long time, I appreciate that they will, will not be um, comfortable debates to have, but better that we start now. Thank you. Libby, thank you very much for this. And our next presenter is Sebastian Kasia. All right, uh, so uh, changing track a little bit, um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that people before me have uh, raised all a lot of the challenges and issues with uh, archiving qualitative social media, uh, archiving social media data, and I'm just going to focus on what's distinctive about qualitative social media data. And qualitative is a bit of an arbitrary term here. Uh, I, I mainly mean small-scale social media data. So if you remember Libby's uh, Hempel's uh, 
presentation at the beginning, I'm talking about the exact opposite end of the spectrum. So manually collected data, often different social media sources within an, a given project, uh, often uh, no use of an API, um, relatively small number of uh, data points, which means uh, we can do individual assessments. We can look at the creators, so the tweet, Facebook posts, etc. creators intent. We can make copyright assessments based on originality uh, or on fair use. We may e even be able to look at consent for individual uh, content creators. And uh, rather than uh, give you um, general guidelines, I just want to kind of delve in a couple of cases of uh, what we've done or how we think about these things. Uh, so first case, uh, this is one of those uh, cases that uh, that Levy Bishop uh, alluded to, right? Highly salient article published in the top uh, journal. Uh, this was in the middle of the refugee uh, crisis, an article on um, Syrian refugees. Uh, some of the data, namely the interviews with refugees and refugee camps were absolutely not shareable. The IRB wouldn't have let us uh, near them uh, for understandable reason. But it was a multi-method article. There were some UNHCR reports that we were able to archive uh, based on uh, their copyright uh, rules. And there was what uh, the author refers to as social media event data. So this is how uh, that data looked. Uh, it was uh, mainly journalistic tweets that pointed to individual um, protest events and then had uh, in almost all cases, a link embedded in it uh, that included further coverage. Uh, when we look at something like this, our go-to framework, and there are a lot of frameworks like this. I like this because it's very pragmatic, that Sarah Menemes and Elizabeth Hull step framework, uh, but a lot of these frameworks are quite similar, um, uh, is, is to follow these step rules. Uh, is it sensitive? It's obviously not sensitive. Can this be made transparent? Yes, it can. And then expectation of privacy, right? That's the tricky one where a lot of individual assessment goes into. But in this case, that's very clear. This is a journalistic organization posting for the public. So there's no expectation of privacy. Um, and uh, can we do this uh, in keeping with the policies of the social media platform? Uh, we think in this case, uh, we uh, we probably can. It's, uh, you know, maybe a little uh, shaky because we do, as you see here, actually just archive the full uh, text uh, of the tweet in addition to the link, but we're not particularly worried about this in particular because this wasn't derived from the um, developer API, so certain terms and conditions were never uh, agreed uh, to. Um, one other thing that I want to point to is, and we haven't talked about this, especially when we're thinking about Twitter, a lot of the value of Twitter comes uh, from uh, links embedded in tweets. And we were very worried about this because the online landscape in Syria at that time was super volatile. And a lot of these links were already down. Uh, so we made sure that every link uh, in a tweet, uh, or there were some public Facebook posts in this too, uh, that we could get a hold on was either archived in the Internet Archive already uh, or we made sure we pushed it to PermaCC, which is a uh, fairly similar service. Uh, just uh, very briefly, by uh, terms of, of uh, comparison, the Internet Archive, everyone I assume is familiar with, free to use. It has an enormous uh, uh, existing archive. Um, it, Archiving API, if it can even be called that, is kind of awkward, but it's usable. Uh, PermaCC um, has a payment model or membership through libraries. Uh, so we go through Syracuse so University's library. There's a really, really nice API that we love uh, working with. It's also in addition to the regular work files, so the web archiving files takes uh, screenshots of pages that it tries to archive. So for some web pages where the work uh, scraping doesn't work well. Uh, the screenshots are a really nice uh, alternative and and preserve uh, site content. They also, uh, because people archive way, way more selectively and they don't actively crawl, uh, they push back uh, more, or they claim at least, to push back more strongly against takedown requests, whereas the Internet Archive uh, will take down stuff pretty quickly uh, when they get any pushback from site or content owners. Um, one other quick case study I want to run to, um, also Syria, this uh, uh, interpretivist ethnographer uh, 
working on kind of the intersection between art, comedy, and compliance with authoritarianism in Syria. Lots of online sources, uh, also lots of uh, video sources. And in addition, we got some uh, TV clips that uh, we actually got copyright licenses to uh, to permit, and that's uh, that's one of the ones that you see there. Uh, on the right. So two things that, that we did there to grab uh, in a reasonably doable way um, the URLs from her entire text. We just took her book and we wrote an art tool and scraped through her entire book and made sure that every URL in her book is archived. The art tool is uh, available uh, on GitHub and, and free to use. It can push either to the Internet Archive or if you have uh, access to PermaCC and uh, be very happy for people to uh, use it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, because she was working on art and comedy, lots of visual uh, and especially uh, video media. So uh, uh, we used uh, Web Recorder. So uh, Web Recorder, again, a dedicated service to archiving, uh, dark archiving, essentially uh, non-static um, web data. And uh, so so nice for things like Vimeo or, or YouTube. Um, and uh, works otherwise fairly similar to the Internet Archive or PermaCC. Uh, last thing, very recent example, those of you who are familiar with the ISS, the uh, kind of listserv for social uh, science uh, data archivists and uh, data librarians, uh, that was, I think, beginning of this week, this came as a, as a question. Uh, so group was, uh, someone wants to archive posts from a private Facebook group, First of all, you know, all your red flags go up and then, you know, the group was created and it's managed by some faculty here and the administrators and members of the group are on board with the project with using the post comments for research purposes. Now, obviously you want to verify that and you want to check that everyone is actually uh, on board with this, but in this type of setting, you could actually go in and individually consent the group members. And then uh, you still have to think about how can you do this to the extent that you are concerned within the context of Facebook's uh, terms and conditions, but at least the ethical uh, conditions, I think uh, we can fairly easily um, comply with and, and do justice uh, to. And again, if you do this with 500 Facebook groups, uh, of course, you wouldn't be able to do this. So, so particular characteristic, again, of, of small scale uh, qualitative uh, social media data. Uh, so some some general uh, thoughts on this. A lot of the things that we think about are quite similar, right? The step framework that I briefly mentioned uh, was developed for more traditional large-scale data, uh, but we can uh, look more closely at individual cases and do uh, one-off evaluations, and that allows us to go a little further uh, in in many cases than you would with larger data collections. Uh, we do if you want some outsourcing to dark archives, mainly because of uh, uh, copyright concerns. Um, they're really terrific platforms and um, we feel pretty good about using them, but there are of course uh, risks in that we don't actually control uh, what happens uh, with those links. So there is an additional uh, layer of trust and additional potential for breakage uh, involved here. And then of course, again, uh, pointing to to dark now because it's it's an invaluable uh, resource and uh, given the advanced time uh, that's it from me thank you very much thank you very much for this Sebastian and now we get to our last presentation of today's webinar given by Oliver Vatela so um just uh this presentation is going to be me uh, as uh, one of the data acquisition people at, at Gezes uh, talking to you. And uh, I haven't introduced, um, included any, oh, let's say, advertisement slides, so just a few words are on Gezes. We're similar institutions to the institution to the ICPSR. We are a data service provider to uh, the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives, um, SESTA. You see the logo on the upper right-hand side. And uh, we have a number of departments uh, dealing, among other things, with social media data. Um, mostly we're dealing with survey data, as a lot of other data archives. 
Uh, our archive was established in 1960, and a couple of years ago, we established another department for computational social sciences. And uh, we have conducted uh, our own little projects, so case studies, looked into other case studies um, that were also mentioned by Yanis and Libby Bishop uh, before. And there's ongoing research on uh, ethics in this area, internet-based data, by my colleagues Katrin Werler, Katharina Kinderkolander, Johannes Breuer, uh, Libby Bishop, and others. Uh, and I'm going to be talking, uh, this is the last presentation, um, about legal issues. And as I also only have 10 minutes, it's going to be rather brief. So I'm going to go through this. I'm happy that so much has been mentioned before. OK, so uh, just. Uh, a quick look at what uh, are we actually talking about archiving this is usually done by and that has been mentioned by repositories data archives or uh, research data centers and preservation also mentioned uh, is not only putting stuff on a server backing it up it's also uh, documentation and publication and what we do and this is done in other archives as well there's a phase before we take in uh, data and that can be named pre-ingest so um, we look at the data that we uh, get aboard, uh, and uh, we do have uh, something like an archiving agreement. So we clarify, for example, legal, the legal basis of data collection and thus the rights to the data. So what, what can we do with the data? And uh, we clarify the condition, conditions of reuse. And then the data is ingested, as it says in the OAS terminology so we check the data quality is it readable and stuff like this and of course I mean if there are legal problems um, we look at re information reduction if necessary or stuff like restricted access what are social media data uh, we're talking a lot about this uh, I need this just briefly to um, to point to the legal restrictions or the, the legal uh, problems that we might face. So social media data to Ober and Wildman is internet-based, of course. It's user-generated user content. So we're looking at everything. It's also been mentioned by Sarah, for example, uh, photos, videos, stuff like this, texts. Um, they're user-specific profiles. This is where your uh, individual level data comes in, personal data probably, not only on the people running a Facebook site or whatever, but also on groups and other individuals. And of course, this is the most um, tangible thing here, that social networking. So that means we, you are linking to other individuals. And the, let's say, most prominent legal issues, legal rights that are um, tied to social media platforms are contractual uh, agreements uh, been mentioned before the, the famous or infamous terms of service um, data protection of course since we are if people leave enough traces about personal data intellectual property rights uh, if people upload photos videos audios whatever um, they are probably the creators or if they are not they might be violating other people's uh, intellectual property rights and uh, something very specific, I'm only uh, like scratching the surface here, database rights. So the entirety of all tweets uh, that uh, Twitter runs might be named a database. And we're using chunks of this. And for example, what's in most cases absolutely prohibited is to, if I mean technically you cannot anyway, but to use, for example, the entirety of a database, including the technical background and make a make a copy of this. Uh, so you might be using parts of the content, but not the database system itself. So what are we looking at? This is another thing. Uh, if we talk about social media research, the topics are as di diverse as social research is. So we are also looking at a lot of sensitive topics, small groups, um, and you can collect the data from social media platforms in various ways which are uh, mentioned in an article forthcoming by Johannes and colleagues, um, of course, by web scraping. Uh, so you don't have to actually enter uh, a website. Here, you probably run into uh, the problem that you've restricted access to information behind a paywall, behind a login. So you might truly be only scraping the, um, 
the screen content. Then you can use an API. It's also been mentioned before. Here you're bound by uh, technical limitations. Uh, so uh, Twitter has uh, cranked down the, the it's how it's called Firehose to uh, a limited amount of tweets that you can you can access via this. Um, then you have uh, maybe uh, you have privileged access. It's also been mentioned by Libby Bishop before. So you cooperate with the platform. But then you're also relying on the data that the platform gives you. Uh, so the, there might be a selection bias here. And you might purchase your way uh, to uh, data collection as well. Uh, so that's another thing. And here we have the problem that you not, might not be able to share this later on, since if there's a, a commercial service, then the platform provider will probably um, withhold this right to himself to sell the data on or to republish it. And what are the legal basis uh, that we're looking at here? There might be, in the case of social media data, probably not that much, the application of a law that's coming from official statistics. So you might have a legal basis. And I'm not making this up because statistical agencies are also looking at internet-based data to use for official statistics. So we might be facing legal frameworks that oblige people to hand over data or to, um, yeah, so there's no voluntary consent here. Then of course, the voluntary informed consent that is also mentioned in a lot of ethical papers. Um, and there are legal ways to gain informed consent. Um, Sebastian has mentioned it before. I mean, you might be scraping uh, data with the consent of the individuals. There might be this thing that, that people call data donation. So uh, people voluntarily handing over their social media content. Uh, tracing with sensors. Um, we've done this in, I think, at least two small scale projects uh, on conferences on site in Cologne. So there are ways. It's difficult, but uh, it's there. Then there's something um, that's probably particular to a number of countries, but not all. That is the freedom of research. So, for example, in the German case, my rights as a researcher are, looking from the constitutional point of view, on the same level as the individual rights of um, research participants. So I always have to strike the balance. And this is where informed consent comes in. I know that this is not true, for example, for the United States, where this is uh, or research is governed by the freedom of, of speech or so different legal settings. And so you cannot rely on this. You can rely on this in the German context though. And then uh, again in red, uh, because it's, it's an open topic, the agreement to terms of service, the usage agreement, or if you purchase data, purchase in contracts. And here we are looking at uh, the fact, and that's also been mentioned before, that some people circumvent this and that we are talking about gray and uh, gray area or gray data um, and um, have people uh, used illegal techniques to get to the data even, uh, hacking, deceit, make up a false profile to get people into um, participate in the study, stuff like this. So this is a tricky question. And then if we look at the data uh, that's supposed to be archived, so we are looking at, at personal data, um, also Elias's nicknames and stuff like this, also not from individuals, yeah, not from the individual only that runs a, a profile that has a Twitter account, but also all the people that he or she is linking to. Think of WhatsApp contacts and people who are not using WhatsApp and all of a sudden the non-WhatsApp users are ending up in a study of WhatsApp users. Uh, what are the legal impediments here? It's data protection legislation. The possible challenges, of course, breach of confidentiality, privacy, also of others. If you upload images and videos and sounds, stuff like this, you are looking at intellectual property rights. But if you take, for example, pictures of uh, videos of individuals, there's also data protection uh, issues involved, probably. I mean, you are taking a video of all your friends in a private setting you upload this, this is a rather old uh, issue already, but uh, if you say, oh, this is me with ABC in whatever, 
all of a sudden you have names to the images and stuff like this and this is personal data. Uh, there might be copyright via violations here, um, breach of individual personal rights. Um, tax is a tricky one. Uh, there has been a law uh, lawsuit uh, last year at a German court, for example, said that ruled that 140 character tweet cannot be copyright protected. But then we do have zillions of other platforms that allow for you to upload larger text. So if there's a certain level of creativity involved, again, we're looking at intellectual property rights. And if you just download texts or reuse them and there's no open license uh, to the text, copyright violation, parts of a database, that's again, uh, you might be using the content of the database, but not make a copy of the actual database system and, and run it on a second platform. And then we're looking at something that is, under under the hood, let's say, the technical metadata. And that's been discussed by a lot of people also. Uh, and some said, it's just metadata. Yeah, but then it's metadata on, well, that li that's linking to other places and that might reveal personal preferences or that might uh, enable researchers to link um, various social media profiles. And all of a sudden, legally, we are talking about profiling because you're gathering information from various platforms. So the main problem here is that data might have been collected without neither consent by the data subject, that's the term from the general data protection regulation, uh, nor consent by the platform providers, uh, the violation that will be a violation of the terms of service. So what does this mean to for archiving the data? What are the, the challenges? Okay, in the ideal case, Sebastian, all rights are clarified. You can look at uh, informed consent and stuff. But then in the real world, often rights are not clarified because we are looking at a world with fast moving research, uh, first come, first serve. The data is there. There is also a kind of distorted view on what is public. Things on the internet are not uh, reusable freely. Uh, that People had to learn this. And classical instruments of data archiving, I put these in quotation marks because they, in the view of social media data, they look like slow-mo uh, tools. Uh, there's of course information reduction when it comes to data protection, pseudonymization and anonymization, or we can aggregate data. Um, well, anonymized data is not protected by law anymore, so it can be re-distributed, uh, but then, all of you who work with this type of data know that anonymization is hardly possible um, and information reduction reduces the value of data. So it, there are a lot of, uh, I talked about the metadata here, so you might delete names but then you are linking to other platforms, other uh, social media profiles and all of a sudden you've got a lot of contextual data that makes de-anonymization possible. The protection of deck, copyright, of course you might delete all copyright protected material and if you look at texts you might know what one to to archive um, let's say the Facebook site as such but only the, the content the text you might come up with a text corpus if it if there is no more copyright protected information then the data can be freely published um, as long as there's no personal uh, information involved as under uh, case a uh, but again, information reduction reduces the value of the data and then you are heavily relying on the content as well. And then there's the protection of the databases. Um, you might only want to archive the content of the database. So we were looking at, for example, archiving a large database with newspaper articles. And in the end, we were only able to archive the content, the categorized content we had to leave aside um, the actual articles, data as facts per se are not protectable. So numbers, for example, brief texts, but uh, an agglomeration, a database and in its entirety, that is protected by specific laws. And access to the data might be more difficult if you cannot uh, preserve the entire database system. 
So if data was collected legally and, and purpose of use remains pu uh, public interest, for example, or scientific or statistic interest, you might be able to also restrict access, that's also been mentioned before, for example, for personal related data, and uh, I point to the GDPR here. Um, and then we also look at other tools that might be transferable uh, from other data that's been made accessible over the past years, past decades. Uh, I came across the term fabrication that is close to what is called synthetic data and official statistic. So you swap data, you distort it, you, you, you make up probably fake data sets. So you cannot go back to the individual, to the original person that uh, created a social media content or whatever. Now you might still be able to run statistical analysis, but these are of course, um, yeah, hampered by the fact that you are you've been tinkering with the data and the repository's answer right now i mean it's things solutions are in the making that's also been mentioned before but we need new tools for the the massive data that we're looking at not 100 tweets 1000 tweets but big data probably not in the in the real sense all the information people among you will say yeah but we're looking true big data is fluent big data, we're looking at millions of tweets or whatever, uh, the three we's come into play here, volume, velocity, variety, and sometimes also veracity, we need new tools to handle this. So we cannot check individual data sets for content as we've done before. There need to be automated ways. We need to sift through text um, analysis, whatever. And there are some things that are being undertaken in this direction. So there are no final answers yet. And I've just scratched the surface here. But thank you for your attention. All right. So here are the questions. Uh, the first one was uh, during uh, Libby's presentation, um, Libby Hempel, that is. And um, I'm just going to read it out to you. Given your role with archiving ethnic minority data and the fact that you are based in Michigan, what do you know of what is being collected about the current Black Lives Matter activity and what are the specific ethical or other challenges of that? Sure, I can, um, so I can speak a little bit about collections. I think that the, the most up-to-date information about um, collection, pro-Black and, and the sort of white supremacist collections um, that are occurring is really from the Documenting the Now group, which I think was in three of the presentations that were made today. So that's the best place to look for current collecting activities. Um, the One of the challenges uh, is that there's something like Blackout Tuesday, where a lot of garbage essentially showed up on the Black Lives Matter hashtag. So all of those plain black screens flooded out at, um, what I would like actual content. So there's sort of this solidarity through silencing that didn't, that was a problem on Tuesday. Um, and there are also a couple of back channels where people are talking about collecting data in order to document. Um, so there's a team, really, I would look mostly at documenting now. Uh, ICPSR tries not to collect data right now. We're in the, practice of taking from researchers data that's already been collected. And we are discussing whether or not we're gonna build infrastructures to do data collection as well. Uh, but so far we have avoided it because we wanna make sure that the data is collected by researchers who are part of the groups rather than by, I should not be collecting data that is important for black lives. I should be preserving data that I am told matters is essentially the stance that we've taken this week and for the last couple. Okay, thank you. And I just got uh, just an organizational thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, you can keep asking the questions in the chat window, which um, so the same window that you used to pose questions before, and we'll try to, Irina and I will try to monitor that um, during the discussion. And the second question is also to Libby. Um, in your presentation, you talked about metadata enhancement. Uh, could you maybe specify this a bit? In our experience, we may have the feeling that metadata, metadata needs to be perfect when it is published. Uh, sure. So I think I don't know what perfect metadata is. So I think if you're waiting for perfect metadata, you'll never publish. Um, I see some smiles in my 
fellow panelists, so maybe this is something we're dealing with too. I think it's okay that metadata get updated um, as we identify, especially as we're watching how are people using the data uh, and what are the ways in which they arrive at the data that we may be able to improve on findability, for instance, by adding particular subject terms um, or expanding our set of subject terms. I think one of the biggest challenges I think is the provenance. So in the metadata declarations that we use, provenance is just a box. And there's very little guidance about what do, what needs to be included in provenance or the data description in order to know what's in there and whether or not it's relevant for a particular question. Um, and what information about how it was collected do I need to know? So for instance, uh, we've been talking about, and I really appreciate especially comments from Sarah and Libby about how our, we have a different obligation as archives than individual researchers do, especially around terms of service. Terms of service are rules that platforms want us to follow. That doesn't mean that they are rules that we should follow. Um, and that's something that I'm happy to pronounce quite a bit. I don't know if I'm ready to stick it on an archive slide yet, but if you, anytime you talk to me, I'm going to say that. And so in the metadata, whether we have violated terms or ways in which we have violated terms, what I can attach as a person who works in an archive may be different from what a researcher can attach because the risks to exposing particular collection processes are different for me as an institution or member of an institution than they are for an individual researcher. So that's another way that we may be able to enhance metadata, meaning the archive may be able to add information to the metadata that a researcher attaching would have put them at risk. Um, and other sort of, because I'm a machine learning researcher, um, other metadata that I might attach are the outputs of models. So additional data that I derived from the social media data becomes metadata to someone else. And that might be complicated. So thinking about like, uh, did we do a sentiment analysis on a particular object? And then what was the outcome of that? Could be metadata or data depending on your position relative to your question. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to the next question, um, which answered. Uh, it was a question to Yanis' presentation. Uh, and the question is, is there a minimum requirement for data to meet each of the FAIR principles uh, that you presented? For example, um, specific score like 80% or higher. Thank you for the, for the question. Uh, no, actually th this is, uh, Part of the discussion of, of the RDA group, uh, which I was uh, uh, briefly involved, uh, actually addressed this and uh, that there is, uh, in a sense, as I may take conclusion, there is no limit or, or, or lower low level of uh, what, what you want to uh, uh, reach. It's, it's uh, something that uh, uh, it's maybe related to the community you're addressing uh, or, or the type of data. Uh, and uh, there, there is actually a discussion uh, how to adapt this to different communities and uh, so there is also always a question of uh, I mean as, as other presenters uh, mentioned that uh, in, in deciding uh, how to archive how, how much of metadata how, 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 how to enhance data itself there is also always a question of uh, purpose. Uh, is there? Is, is 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 does it make sense to invest so so much time? So it's uh, for for the highest value of data, uh, the, the the data that is uh, the most uh, uh, interesting for the reuse. For of course, you want to uh, achieve the highest score. But uh, as I said, it's more a, a motivational principle. It's not so that there is a, a limit uh, you need to reach to pass through. It's it, even if certain founders wanted to use it as such. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Um, I know we have some questions that we received before at the start of the um, of the workshop that are um, can be discussed by the panelists. Um, or the, the, this one's I'm sorry, this one is one that came in still during the presentations, and I, I'm thinking it's mostly targeted to, towards Oliver's presentation. Um, and the question was if it is legal to use images, videos shared on social media platforms, uh, for example, profile pictures, screenshot showing tweets or uh, Facebook posts. So this is a very specific question. I, I think it, it came in during Oliver's presentation, so I'm assuming it's mostly addressed to him. Okay, thank you for this. Um, I see two different questions here. The one is that um, uh, 
images and videos I'm sharing on a platform. Um, and the other thing is that uh, screenshots uh, uh, showing tweets, I mean, this is, so um, I'm taking a picture of, of social media content, so to say. I mean, um, yeah, as I said, in, intellectual property rights kick in here. Uh, if somebody, if you, somebody posts a picture, the person taking the picture is the author of the picture of the photograph and, and technically or legally uh, he or she is uh, owns the rights to this uh, photograph uh, um, and then to reuse it you actually have to ask for permission uh, of, and now we're back to the slow motion world uh, of offline content or the non-social media uh, content that you share via other platforms actually you have to ask for permission uh, the same holds true for profile pictures this i'm i'm posting uh or i'm opening a profile with my picture and if you reuse it you have to ask me for permission uh, i know that this is often not done and this is the uh, a major problem because and i think this is linked to the the idea that things on the net are in the public or in the public sphere if I take a book off my shelf, I place it on my front door, it's still my book. And that also holds true to pictures, videos, whatever you, you record. Um, so, yeah, it's legal, but you have to ask, unless there's a certain open uh, license attached to it. So the person, as we uh, will be doing with these slides, says, okay, this is free to use. Uh, you can, this is a CC by license, this is a CC whatever, a Creative Commons license, um, then you might be able to share this uh, without asking for, uh, there are a lot of platforms, for example, that offer pictures for free reuse. So um, yeah, uh, se several things, but you need to make sure that you will look at the, the licenses attached. Okay, thank you, Oliver. And now we do come to the questions that we received before the start of the webinar. Uh, and one question was, what if researchers do not know which terms of service they agree to? And also, what if they scrape the data, which I'm assuming means they didn't go through the API? So feel for anybody who wants to answer, feel free to, to, to start. I mean, the, we can typically reconstruct which terms and services they would have had to accept to, to do certain things, right? If you use the Twitter developer AT, uh, API, we know what they agree to if you use XY commercial service. So that we can typically trace back even if they don't know. If they scrape the data, we typically know that they violated the terms and conditions uh, because in most cases that's not, that violates the site's terms and conditions. And then we need to, uh, you know, decide and I think multiple people have uh, have spoken to this and I think Libby has the uh, Hemphill has the strongest opinions on on this but uh, then you make assessments you know um, is this important enough to uh, to to risk uh, is this uh, are there other concerns that maybe should prevent you from sharing uh, those sorts of things yeah thank you Libby you want to also add to that Libby, uh, H, that is. I do, and then I'd like to hear from Sarah and Libby because I think that they share my sentiment quite a bit here. Um, I think that some of what researchers need to know depends on the data that they collected and its value to history and to science. That is, and then something about what users' expectations might have been for that data. So I don't think that there's a blanket terms of service guideline that we should or should not follow. I think it depends on the context of the data and its use. I would um, second that. Uh, and then just to say, um, I do think archives need to make their own decision about whether obeying terms of service is in line with their remit and their mandate. Uh, but that's not to say that some elements of terms of service aren't useful. So it's I try and remind myself that, for instance, Twitter's user agreement and um, Facebook's user agreement, for instance, um, are there to protect users. Um, I don't know that they're doing a great job of it otherwise, but um, so it, you should be familiar uh, with the terms of service and sort of take into consideration 
what elements of um, or aspects of those terms are there to protect users and, and think about those implications. Uh, but again, I, I think, think archives, as Libby H has said, are different from researchers and other users and very, very different from big corporations that buy huge chunks of data to do consumer analysis to sell people things. Um, and our sort of remit as an institution, you know, is often has a much longer time scale. So we're here to keep things for 100 years or in perpetuity in some cases, um, aka forever. So I do think you need to take that into consideration when you make those decisions also. I think Libby uh, B was next. Yeah, I'll chime in with similar messages, but I, I you know, whichever way we come down on a violation of, of terms of service, I would certainly never advocate that it be done unknowingly, okay? So um, I think it should, you know, we're talking about what metadata fields need to be developed for processing data and clearly collecting information about terms of service collected uh, in, that applied at the time of collection is part of a metadata profile for this, this kind of, of data. So even if the decision comes later that it can, you know, be shared, be archived, whatever, re researchers should not proceed down a path of violation without knowing precisely what they're doing and having a um, well, uh, well developed argument uh, about why a violation might be appropriate. I'm not sure if the parallel holds completely. Um, Sebastian, you and I both have the background in, in qualitative data, but there's, you know, there's a, a lot of consent has become so prominent, partly because of the general data protection regulation. We forget there is a tradition of un, of handling unconsented qualitative data. Okay, and there are examples of this where a research, you know, where research requires participants to not know what things are going on. Um, there can be other kinds of historical reasons why lack of of consent may may be relevant. So again, I'm I think it's it's I don't want to say rules are there to be broken, but typically know that you're doing it. And there is also a, can, can be a fairly um, thought through framework or set of questions, kind of like the step stuff that you were talking about, Sebastian, to, to assess whether or not a, a violation or a breach is appropriate for any given collection or any given situation. I think uh, Oliver also wanted to, to add or yeah, just a quick comment. I'm also I'm um, we were looking at this and uh, just uh, a couple of months ago, um, an expertise was published for the German legal situation. And one thing is some probably something for other countries also to look at. When we were looking at a lot of anglophone or uh, uh, countries with English law in quotation marks, that's very different from. Uh, European continental law, for example, and uh, in the German case, the, uh, your terms of service are governed by national laws. So uh, you, a company might be writing down something that you sell your soul to us, this is illegal. And the expertise went exactly this direction for the German case, saying that um, they doubt that a lot of the what is laid, da laid out in the terms of service by Twitter and other platform uh, providers is legal in the national sense. So, what is the what is the owner? What are the the rights of these platforms to the data actually created by um, users? Yeah, user created content, user created profiles, and all this. Uh, and are they uh, allowed to make these restrictions? And uh, there's a, there are two uh, expertises actually, and they advocate web scraping and. It's also legal by law, by the German copyright law. There's an article on web scraping, although it talks about deleting the data after uh, analysis or handing it over to an archive. And uh, I think the, the main challenge here, and especially true uh, for the United States, is who wants to go to court with Google, Facebook, other companies. So there's an enormous power imbalance here and even if you, I mean, you as a single researcher, you violate terms of service and you've got this um, terrible case of sorts versus the United States and all of a sudden you've got federal government or whoever coming in. Um, and that is, I think, the main problem because otherwise you could find it out in court and you probably would find out, find out that platforms don't own all the rights to all the data they are having in their databases or on their servers. I think uh, Libby H also wanted to add. I 
Yeah, uh, two things. So to directly answer Oliver's question, who wants to go to court? Um, the ACLU in the US wants to go to court and they are ready to do so and have recently gotten a victory around the CFAA, which governs scraping essentially. And I think the tide is turning in the in American jurisprudence at least. Um, and that relates to who ought to go to court. I think this is something that archives ought to do, that we are in a position to advocate directly for both for policy change, both legally and at platforms that individual researchers cannot do. And it shouldn't be that only those with special relationships with social media platforms have access to data that is important for history and science and for understanding our moment, whether we understand it now or later. And we are in a position as institutions to advocate and pressure in ways that individual researchers are not. Um, and I think we have an obligation to do so. Just, sorry, humor said, I, I hear an upcoming ISIST panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens. <laughs> all right, thank you for, for all the answers. I'm gonna move on to the next question that we received. Um, it's quite a, sort of related, and where and how do copyright and legal restrictions impact the archiving social media data? Oliver talked about this quite quite a bit already, and we had this in this discussion. Uh, this is a very general question, but maybe there are some other things um, that, um, like summing up or repeating, especially from Oliver's question, uh, we could answer here. A couple of things that I would add from the U.S. perspective, and I would urge everyone to remember that copyright. Uh, varies in subtle ways across uh, jurisdictions. Um, so one is that in the US, uh, and I think that's fairly universally the case, copyright uh, protects original works. So one reason we were very com uh, comfortable with uh, archiving some of the tweets we showed, I showed was um, that they were just statements of fact, uh, which aren't uh, copyrightable as such. But that's not true for every tweet. You can certainly write poetry in 288 characters, and that would very much be uh, a uh, original work, and and we'd be concerned about that. Uh, the other thing, and that's very much a U.S. Uh, specificity, is uh, fair use. Right? There are certain conditions under which, in, under U.S. law, you can uh, claim that you're using um, works in a broader context. So you're using works without affecting uh, commercial interests of the original owner. There's like a catalog of uh, arguments that you can uh, run through that uh, may allow you to archive small selections of uh, social media data that are under copyright. Uh, but it's an iffy area to go into as an archive because it's poorly defined. No one uh, it's hard to say whether you would win, say, uh, uh, a fair, uh, fair use lawsuit, but uh, where data are valuable and where things look good for fair use in the U.S., we can do that. I know that in Germany that, for example, doesn't exist. Anybody else wanted to respond? So, just, I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, sure. Just, Sure, just ahead. one comment briefly, um, Johanna and, and Oliver, you correct me, but I also think it's it's worth raising the point that we talk about social media data, but the legal conditions, and I think even around copyright ownership are, are very different across platforms. And so it's one of the reasons you have to know the specific platform. So I'm pretty sure Twitter keeps copyright in its stuff. Facebook, I think, says that you you still own copyright in your own posts. Um, I don't don't quote me on that, but um, and the point is platforms vary, and when it's it in some cases is really hard to make even any kind of general statement about social media data because it's so platform specific. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen in a second because uh, I was just adding a few of the questions that came in. Um, we were here. Um, so the next question that we have is, uh, who should archive social media data? So I'm assuming this is kind of the question of responsibility, who does what, like the researchers or the archive, uh, and for how long is the commitment, should be the commitment to it, and also that's of course a very important practical question, especially for researchers, where does the funding to curate collections come from, where should it be coming from?
<laughs> Nobody wants to. Bad place, silence. Yeah. I can tell a short story about where funding does not come from that will buy the rest of you a little bit of time. Um, so a lot of funding for science and science infrastructure in the US comes from the National Science Foundation. And when we have applied to the research infrastructure programs there, we have been asked by panelists what the so reviews are made by groups of researchers. Uh, we've been asked whether there's any demand and why would anyone need social media data? Does anyone actually use it? Um, and I haven't really known how to answer that except to leave my mouth open, which is impossible to convey in typed grant applications. Uh, so I'm curious about where funding comes from as well. We're not comes from member institutions, uh, but our member institution priorities, um, sort of where social media fits in there are, it depends on the institution and the types of work that people are doing. And so we haven't really committed many membership funds. We've been looking for outside funding. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, but so far not from the National Science Foundation. Well, maybe I can add something from the, the German perspective uh, and Johannes uh, and Libby, you can add to this because we've applied for for federal funding, uh, not necessarily only for social media data. And I think that's uh, this is what does the trick here. I mean, a lot of the fun or the, one of the questions from the funders was like, why do you want to archive this? And of course, I mean, sometimes you will be asking, OK, mm, why Twitter streams? for national election hmm. okay once twice but then you have to to wrap it into a bigger context on internet-based data and all of a sudden we're talking about different data sources but similar techniques to collect the data curate the data and um, as, I, as i mentioned before that for example the national statistical office in germany is also looking at sensor data to improve its statistics on on land use for example, uh, all of a sudden we're talking about image, uh, about censoring data and stuff like this. So it's not merely social media data. I would also doubt that uh, anybody would give us a major funding for just uh, archiving this type of data. But if you put it into a bigger context, uh, there might be a chance because it's becoming very important. It's, it's of utmost importance. And uh, the European archives, for example, uh, combined in SASTA or also in the, the World Federation of Archives, if those ICPSR is around f almost as long as we are, uh, 1960s. I mean, we've gone through uh, waves of new types of data being opened up, official statistics. A couple of years ago, it was qualitative data. For decades, people would say like, well, who wants to, uh, qualitative data is impossible. No, it's not or experiment, data from experimental designs. If you want to do an experiment, gather 30 people, do the experiment again, just do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there are no standardized descriptions of the of the experiments. And yeah, yeah, I can also do a prisoner uh, dilemma experiment, but how? So I think this, this is taking a little time here. And I think that all this discussion, it's a very broad and I think very fascinating discussion surrounding ethics and it's not only covering ethics. Um, yeah, opens the way to persuading funding agencies also to see that it's not like a little thing that you do with, yeah, to, just to have quick data to, to play around with, but it's a playground to come up with methods to collect bigger streams of data, other types of data that are very similar. Thank you. But just in the because uh, we have a few questions left, if that's okay, I'd uh, move on uh, to the to the next one, which is a follow up to one that we got before, and this is just copy paste. So excuse the not edited style here. Um, and uh, this is about the the sharing of the screenshots before. Uh, so the example is if we work with 1,000 Twitter profiles, is it it is not possible to ask everyone for permission to use their profile picture and name. In this case, can we stop bothering about IPR and publish the results or how should we proceed? Um, again, this is the follow-up question to the screenshot question that we had before. Well, first of all, you have to show that it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work. I mean, I can, I can give you an example from a, a commercial project that's been going on. A Swedish company has gathered uh, millions of profiles from uh, middle level and high level management 
and wanted to sell the data and then the postal, uh, Polish uh, data protection official said like, um, have you tried to contact these people? And the company said, like, oh, this is beyond our, the scope of our budget. We cannot, we, we simply, we cannot contact all these people. And then they got a fine of 200,000 euros, which is like $250,000 and, uh, or a bit more. Um, so, uh, yeah, you have to make sure that, I mean, for that, but that also depends on the legal situation. In Germany, if you can show that your research is important, that you try to contact these people and that it was just beyond the scope, I mean, you didn't reach out or you couldn't reach out to all of these, you might be able to archive the data or reuse it. But then um, you should first try, yeah. It's so, also the question, do you need to, right? Like how often is the profile picture an essential part of your research? And sometimes it may be, right? But in a lot of cases, if you think about intellectual property, right? Like, do you need to archive things uh, that are most, most creative, right? And most identifying uh, in some cases too. Um, and, and if you don't need to, uh, don't. I mean, don't unnecessarily. Uh, uh, break the law <laughs> at a minimum. Yeah, thank you. I think it's the same if I may add to, with survey data. If you don't need a particular piece of information in your survey, don't ask it if it's potentially exactly. sensitive. If, if, if it's just like for demographics, but it's sensitive, uh, also usually the guidance that, that we give or that I give is that then don't ask about it uh, if it's sensitive. All right, uh, we got uh, two more questions that came in. One is a lengthy one, which I just now have to like live read to you. This is a question to everyone not from GESIS. So this is a question from a person at GESIS. So it is not discrimination based on, on uh, institutional affiliation. What are your experiences with social media researchers' interests in archiving their data? Are they um, actively approaching archives, um, especially also of gold standard high quality data sets of Levy Bishop mentioned. From our experiences, some researchers from social science and media and communication backgrounds are indeed uh, interested. Um, but um, the large georeference data set that Libby used as a resample was uh, actively recruited uh, by the archive, uh, for example. So just think, yeah. What's the interest from the research community? Uh, how, how do they reach out um, to archives? Maybe I could start with, with answering, uh, and I, I would say uh, we we are like in Slovenia. We, we even don't have uh, uh, an an active uh, obligation for the researchers currently to uh, to to archive any kind of data. So um, we are we are still in a position that we we need to actually actively engage and motivate and uh, explain and so. And so um, I think it's uh, for for most of the example uh, examples that uh, um, I encountered uh, in uh, the data archiving uh, um, that they engage in data archiving, they were related to to the publication. So I think that journals and um, the the question of reproducibility is uh, one one major motivation for for. Uh, going into the archiving and then it's it depends it's sometimes it can be just uh, you know uh, not, not uh, very uh, intensive uh, uh, effort uh, put into the uh, every aspects there because certain journals they don't require uh, much of uh, the the um, they don't have uh, maybe high criteria for this but yeah this is the situation we we have we are. From my experience at ICPSR, the relationships with researchers and their interest in archiving data are very similar to researchers and other types of data, which is most of the time I have to go get it uh, and encourage researchers to deposit. Not because researchers are opposed to deposit, but that it's just not part of a normal research practice yet. Uh, and so, but there are a couple of exceptions. So for instance, ICPSR has a collection of Me Too tweets from a research group at Northeastern University where they deposited with us and then we worked with them to get the deposit to follow their guidelines. Um, 
I've deposited data about uh, US Congress and what it does on Twitter and the rules I've applied there are very different because they're public figures um, making speech acts. Uh, but I, yeah, so some researchers actively approach archives, but much of my job in an archive and as an archive director is to go get data that is of value to the research communities that we serve. And that's still true even with social media data. And often the first concern that I hear from researchers when I ask them if they'd be willing to share their data is about terms of service. And so we have that whole conversation that we just had about archives and their obligations and what terms do and who's gonna go to court um, with researchers. And some people are still nervous, understandably, and decide not to share their data. And some are like, yeah, let's fight, here we go. Um, so it depends on who they are and what kinds of protections and privileges they experience at their institutions. Uh, and then what their data is about and how important they think it is for others to be able to access it. Maybe just to complete the, the round, the other two people who are not from Gases, maybe you can also, if you like answering that quickly. We have exactly, like literally everything Libby said up to the fighting researchers. We never had one of those, but everything else is exactly the same for us. Okay. Yeah, I have been approached by researchers who do have just a little bit of anxiety around all the social media data they've collected and um, often having a funding requirement of having to deposit it and wanting to know how to do that. So it does sound very, very similar. Um, and I think it's only when researchers have been reminded that they do need to do this that they suddenly are interested in learning more about uh, how to go about it and, and what the risks um, they take on for doing that. Okay, thank you. And now we're, uh, we've reached the time limit, but we have one question. I think this. Hopefully, it's the one that we can do like a short round and everybody gives a certain answer to that. Uh, what types of standards do you use to implement metadata for social media data, I'm assuming? Uh, and maybe uh, everybody can just like quickly, at least for each uh, institution can just uh, quickly answer that. Um, we do DDI uh, uh, codebook, so uh, old school uh, DDI. Uh, and uh, have a mapping to the data site metadata kernel or where it makes sense. If we do runs, I'll just go in the order of the videos uh, that I see here. So Sarah would be next. Um, so in my previous role, DPC, was, we didn't have an archive. We weren't a repository. Uh, so we weren't the ones taking um, social media data. Uh, and I, I'm not sure um, at Edinburgh, uh, what exactly is being used. So I wouldn't want to speak out of turn without being sure. Okay, Libby H. Uh, also DDI. That was quick, <laughs> Giannis. Yeah, we, we only have a, a few cases of uh, social media data and we used uh, DDI. Um, and uh, well, uh, there's probably a question, uh, is this enough? As, as, as Libby mentioned that, that there are certain uh, fields that uh, need to be uh, more elaborated probably. And um, so probably there, there would be a combination of different metadata that would be perfect for, for uh, um, addressing all the aspects, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then cases, maybe Oliver, because you're uh, more more on the in data ingestion side. Yeah, I'm also brief, it's DDI. And since we're registering the data, it's the data site kernel, so we pass on. We use various type, uh, versions of, of DDI. All right, okay, thank you. That was a good quick uh, last question or quick to answer. Um, and yeah, we're doing pretty well in terms of time. We answered all of the questions that we received, actually. The remaining ones are from me, which were kind of something that I noted down, but we can talk about that uh, in another context or um, uh, off screen, if you will. Um, again, thank you for all of the presentations. Thanks uh, to everybody attending. And we will be sharing uh, the recording of this and uh, as well as the slides through the SESTA um, Zenodo repository. Um, it's been uh, mentioned in the chat. And all of the people who registered for this event will be um, notified uh, when these uh, 
materials are released. So uh, thanks again, especially to the presenters, uh, my co-organizer Karen and Irena, and uh, to everybody who attended this. I hope you uh, found this interesting and learned something from it. I, I definitely did. Uh, I very much enjoyed this. And um, yeah, looking forward to carrying on the conversation. I'm sure that everybody who presented here is fine with uh, the attendees reaching out to them if they have additional questions. I I'm, I'm, certainly am. If I can point you to any resources or um, other things, uh, feel free to reach out to us. You have the contact details in the slides um, so you know how to find us. Again, um, thank you, everybody, and uh, take care. Bye. Yeah, and thank you, Johannes, for organizing, yeah. and Karen and yeah. Irina. This video is produced by the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. For more information on CESTA, please visit www.cesta.eu.